I want to look at some questions that you might have as we start looking at, at philosophy and Christianity. Um, one question you might have, this is the question I have, this is what I want to answer in my, in my dissertation, if Lord willing he lets me pass these comps. <laughs> but, uh, but this question I think is the most fundamental question for philosophers. How is thinking possible? Immanuel Kant attempted to answer this question and ended up answering it as long as you don't ask him yet one more question where he gets his idea. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about Immanuel Kant coming up, so I don't want to ruin that surprise. Well, you'll love that. Uh, but, uh, but I believe reform theology is the only theology that can answer this question biblically. Um, with other belief systems, um, within our Christian brotherhood, even conservative Christians, you will find people that still hold to a strong belief in self-evident uh, truths and reason. Um, and, you know, sadly you'll find it in schools that have been conservative for many years, but still have not at least had anyone help them come to the realization that they are holding this view, even though they may not. If you put it out to them saying, you are really placing all of your Christian beliefs on logic and reason, they would say, oh, we're not doing that. But then they do it in practice in their classrooms to their students day after day, and then they expect their students to be biblical when they leave. So what, what we want to do in this class is really get down to how we answer that question and how we do it biblically, particularly. Um, so do we answer that question by saying, well, thinking is possible because God, it's a gift from God. And like a tool, we can use it at our own discretion. So God said, here is this neutral thing called reason. It is neither good nor evil. It is just this system of thought that now I will give to you, and you can use it in this neutral realm that you live in, where you are neither prone to evil or prone to good, but this logic will help you uh, know what truth and falsity is. Is thinking possible in that uh, reason... Uh, is reason a perfect part of God's creation? And so God created the world, and reason was one of the things he created, and it was perfect. But then in the fall, it uh, didn't get hurt, maybe. So if we use it properly, we can know objective truth. We just have to use it properly. The problem with the fall is that we just started using logic improperly. If we can just go back to learning how to do it properly again, bam, we're back. Um, now these different things I'm showing you are, are the things that we're going to look at that conservative Christians who love the Lord have held to. Um, was reason affected by the fall? Or was it only our will that was affected by the fall and reason was not affected by the fall? You won't believe who holds to that one. Jonathan Edwards. You know, I grew up thinking, Jonathan Edwards, man, he's the guy. He's the reformed guy. He's the man. You know, we Americans can say, we have a good American reform guy. It's Jonathan Edwards. Not so much. We'll look at that. Is our thinking reliant on God? Now this is what all Christians... Of course our thinking is reliant on God. I would never say it's not reliant on God. That would be unchristian. But in practice, I will demonstrate how over and over we can think outside of God's realm. You know, he gave it to us, so it's our neutral little thing. But he gave it to us, so it's still reliant on God because he gave it to us. 
Uh, the kind of reliance I'm talking about is going to be a reliance which tethers you to God at every possible moment and aspect and position of your life. Where you are inseparable from God. And this includes the unsaved. They do not walk in a world outside of God. They, there is a relation there. We're going to talk what that relation is. If so, if our thinking is reliant on God, how does the finite relate to the infinite? Maybe some of you have heard of Soren Kierkegaard. Anyone heard of Soren Kierkegaard? Okay. He was a Danish philosopher. Um, he was obscure for many years because no one wanted to translate Danish uh, into into other languages, but finally they did, thanks to the Hong family. Uh, but anyway, they, uh, with, with Kierkegaard, he wanted to answer this question, how is it possible for the finite and infinite to relate? That is the question we need to answer. We serve an infinite God. How is it possible that we relate to him as finite beings? How has God made it? So we can have a relationship, a finite human having a relationship with an infinite God. How are we even in relation to him? See, this is something the deists could not answer, so the deists said there is no relation. He can't relate to us because we're finite and he is infinite. How can those two things mix? They can't. The minute God relates to the infinite, or the infinite God relates to the finite human, God becomes finite or the human becomes infinite. So how is it that they're able to have relation but maintain finiteness and infiniteness on either side? This is a question that if you were to ask many conservative professors at conservative schools, they probably wouldn't know what to say at first. Probably if they did some research they would say, well, God relates to us through words, through language. Now that's unusual because that's how the Muslims believe, which is why you have to learn Arabic in order to read the Quran, because any translation of the Quran is a translation of the God's very words. It should be blasphemy. Um, so when you walk into your local Barnes and Noble and you see that English translation of the Quran, you can know that no one in the Muslim world thinks you're really reading the Quran. They think what you're doing is participating in a horrible blasphemy against Allah. Um, so this question is, is something that lays strong on us as Christians. How is it that the infinite God is relating to the finite man without either being compromised? I want to demonstrate for you the distance there is between the finite and the infinite. In Job 9, 32 through 33, For he is not a man, as I am, this is, of course, Job talking, that I should answer him, and we should come together, and we should come together in judgment. Do you see what he's saying there? He is not a man as I am that I should answer him so that they could come together and have some kind of philosophical conversation about what should be done. Neither is there any uh, daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Mediation. Mediation. This is something Kierkegaard, this would haunt Kierkegaard at night when he slept at night, mediation. How does the infinite mediate to the finite? How does the finite even mediate what he is relating to in the infinite? It's impossible. This is why he kept talking about this leap of faith. But you see, there's something with Kierkegaard that a lot of people don't understand, is that the leap of faith is a pronoun that was inserted by the translators and it's a it's a wrong pronoun 
Uh, Kierkegaard never talked about a leap of faith in, the in his Danish works. Uh, Kierkegaard said, it's a leap to faith. Think of the difference between those two words. A leap of faith means I have faith which allows me to leap. A leap to faith says there is nothing helping me to leap but me so that I may obtain it. That's Kierkegaard's message. You are able to leap to it. It's yours for the taking if you're not just a knight of resignation but a knight of faith. Here Job is making a strong understanding here that he says, who is it that could be even our mediator between us? Some kind of daysman, some kind of man that can say, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll interpret what God says to you and then I'll interpret what you say to God because you guys are so, so distant. Psalm, one Psalm 113, 5 through 6, Who is like unto the Lord our God? who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. My favorite, which is Romans eleven thirty three through 36 Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Listen to these, these words. Of him, he is the Alpha Creator. Through him, he is the sustainer. And to him, he is the omega inheritor. Are all things. This is our God. How is it that we are able to have relation with a God that cannot be understood, that cannot, you can't search the depths of this God. You can't even touch him. How is it that we can have mediation, a relationship? Um, if you were to ever go to Westminster and you were to take a apologetics class from Dr. Oliphant, he would require you to memorize this particular portion of the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, article 1. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part. Voluntary condescension. God had to condescend to us for us to have relation. Now the question is, and I think every Bible scholar will agree on this, yes, God condescended to us. The question then comes, how does God condescend to man? Does God condescend by using logic? Imagine the ramifications if it is through logic that God has decided to condescend to man. God said, well, the, the distance between the finite thing I have created and the infinite person that I am is too great. I need to condescend to them. So I will condescend using logical reasoning. <clears throat> if that is the case, every philosophical attack on Christianity was, no, was not an attack. It was helping them. Because every attack on Christianity from philosophy was simply saying, Base your Christianity on logic, and that will enlighten you to your religion. So if God condescended to us through logic and reasoning, then every, every single foundation of our Bible, every, every foundation of your belief system, all of it 
should then come down to logic. So that Thomas Aquinas is right. Unaided logic, if you, if you think properly, unaided logic will lead us to God from the ground up. Through just looking at nature, you can know there is, there is a God and believe. By looking at nature, can you know there is a God? Yes. Does it lead you to belief? What leads you to belief? God's special revelation, right? Because we are fallen. Because we are fallen. So how is it that it is possible for us to have a relation, a finite being, have relation with an infinite God? Westminster Confession 7.1 points this out, that by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. Now, this particular hour is going to be spent mostly on what on earth that means. Because I grew up a dispensational Baptist from when I was born in 1972. In December of 1970, it was almost 1973, so I'm not that old. <laughs> but, uh, but from when I was born in 1972, I was an independent fundamental dispensational Baptist. And I lived that way all the way until 2007. That seems pretty recent, does it not? <laughs> it does to me anyway, because I'm old. Uh, but in 2007, the Lord got a hold of my heart in a way it has never been held before. I do not, I think I played the game of Christianity for all those years. But I did not know the Lord. I did not have victory over sin. I did not have the guilt. But when the Lord got a hold of my heart during a reform conference, when someone was preaching out of John 10, I felt my heart begin to pound in my chest. I almost thought people could hear it. It was intense. And it was intense because for the first time in my life I felt guilty. Now some of you may have gotten saved later in life and you understand you know even without God there's certain things your conscience kind of bothers you and you know and things like that. There's also things you do against God. Your conscience doesn't bother you because he's not your God. When all that sin starts coming down on you and you realize, I am guilty, I am guilty, everything changes, right? And that happened to me in 2007. And so I understand living m most of my life as a dispensational Baptist, I understood that when you come to uh, something like a Westminster Confession, right? Uh, one of the songs I remember singing when I was a kid, um, uh, how does that, how does that even go? Something about, I need no confession, I, I need no confession, uh, what was it? Lord, you have no plea, it is enough that Jesus died and then he died for me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> How does that, how does, what's the exact words? No other argument. No other argument. I need no other no one It is enough as Jesus died. Yeah. And somewhere in there it says, you don't need confession. You don't need a confession. I wish I had a Baptist hymnal on me now. I'd show it to you. Uh, but, but I remember singing that. And I, I mean, so, you know, some of you might have come from that background. Maybe you're still in that, I don't know. But when you see, you know, well, that's what the Westminster Confession says, but what does Scripture say? Right? Because that's what my dad would say. Because he uh, is still very Baptist and does not like what happened. <laughs> um, but uh, that's what I want to do. I want to take us through what Scripture does say. How is it possible that we have a, that we stand in a covenant relationship with the Lord? 
Um, back when Cornelius Van Til was a professor over at Westminster, he would create this this diagram on the board with his chalk. He would uh, he would write God and then circle it, and then he'd have these arrows pointing down to another circle that says creature. And he wanted to demonstrate that there is a creator-creature distinction where there is an aseity to God, right, but not to us. Um, and you guys know what aseity is, right? It's, a, it's a, um, this idea of ase, uh, Latin. We'll get to that more. There's some Latin coming up. I'll teach you some. Alan will too. He probably knows more than I do. All right. But this, this distance was important to him because there is a huge problem the minute that circle begins to enter this circle, right? Once this circle has some kind of, oh, it changes by pressing it. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Uh, let's go back to that. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to touch it next time. <laughs> I didn't know that. I could just smack the... Okay. Once this circle enters into that circle even a little bit, what's the problem, uh, systematic guys? What happens if there's just a bit of our creatureliness in the essence of God's creatorness? He's no longer... No longer has a say that he's no longer God. That's right. So. Yeah. Remember, because God is, God is identical with every attribute that he has. The minute we become a part of an attribute in a univocal way or in the same way, we now either become God or he has become finite. Something has to give because his, in his being he has something we have. And that's a problem. So Cornelius Van Til used to draw this picture where you have a distinct separation. Now what is holding this circle to this circle? If it's logic, again, we're in trouble. He said, Scripture teaches us, our fathers have taught us, that what's holding this circle to this circle is covenant. Cool. All right. Nothing? How about now? Okay. So according to Cornelius Van Til, when it all comes down to it, we are either covenant keepers or covenant breakers. How is this possible? A lot of people uh, kind of look at What's his name? John Piper. As kind of like, he's, he's a reformed guy. He's, he's Mr. Reformed. Uh, we should read his reformed books about how reformed he is about reformation and re reforming. I would, I think he has some nice devotional things. Um, if you want devotional. If you're looking for deep things, I wouldn't hold too tightly to, to, to Dr. Piper. <laughs> I'd be careful, and this is why. As Reformed believers, pactum is very important because it holds what God has created for us as reality. Let me, let me demonstrate what I mean. If there is no covenant of works... Our tie to Adam is questionable. The minute you take the covenant of works away, how is it that you are tied to Adam's sin? How you answer that is very important. Dr. Piper does not believe in a covenant of works. Um, and, you know, he's obviously he's not a Presbyterian or anything like that. He's a... He's a Baptist guy, so he's a Reformed Baptist. And our Reformed Baptist brethren, you know, they, they don't hold to every father that we hold to, and that's, and that's fine. Uh, 
that's fine in that they're still going to heaven. <laughs> it's not fine in that they're, they're, they're not able to swallow the whole pill. And I think it's important to swallow the whole pill. What I mean is, how you are tied to Adam will demonstrate whether there is real depravity or not. There's this new thing going on with young, restless, and reformed, which is basically a bunch of dispensationalists that have discovered Calvinism and are rethinking some things. But they're not really discovering Calvinism. They're discovering the four points of Tulip and thinking, I like that, without taking into context anything else that Calvin has to say. The four points of tulips taken out of the context of Calvin is not Calvinism anymore. You should call it something else, because Calvin wouldn't call it Calvinism. <laughs> Those four points need to stay securely within the context of what Calvin was talking about, which is scripture. And in that case, this new restless, young restless and reform thing is a little annoying to me because it's, it's as if people have gone up to the salad bar of the reform belief system and said, oh, I like tomatoes, but ooh, I'm not big on uh, cashews, so I'm just going to leave those. You understand what I'm saying? And so there needs to be some kind of, of understanding now that you're on the seminary level. You're thinking on a deeper level. You're thinking beyond a devotional book or beyond even beyond some of the books that are given to you as textbooks, you eventually will be getting to the point in your thinking where you will be thinking beyond them. In other words, as you're reading it, you'll be thinking, that's a mistake. And that's a mistake because I know this and this and this. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what I, I hope we get to. Um, <clears throat> how you are tethered to Adam will be the key to how it is your mind works. You see, R.C. Sproul holds to Thomas Aquinas' view of what we call the third way. We'll get to all that when we get to Thomas Aquinas in a few days. But in holding to Thomas, R.C. has to take on the whole Thomas, who says, in, when we fell, when Adam fell, reason did not fall. Reason stayed in its neutral perfection, and Adam fell with his, with his leanings. He tended now to lean more towards sin than good things. But reason, good reason, stayed neutral, so if you have good reason, you can still get back to where you were. If you don't take the train all the way to the station, um, you're not going to have a consistent view. So R.C. can say, well, I like the third way, but I don't like that part where, you know, reason is, you know, uh, neutral. Well, then get off the train, because the third way is tied to that. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, Greg Bonson, do you guys, are you guys familiar with Bonson at all? He was, he followed Van Til quite closely, a very strong thinker. Um was in a lot of debates and things like that, uh, and won soundly. Died at a young age, which is very sad. But he would, he would say it this way. He would say, every philosophical and theological system is all tied like a train, one, one compartment tied to another all the way down. And when you decide, I like that car, you get in that car, you're on the train that holds all those other cars together. You cannot say, well, I want this car to go to New York City while the rest of the train goes to Texas. Because the train holds together through its cars. So if you like one car and you get in that car, you're tethered to, the, to it all. The minute you start trying to pull cars off, you're, the whole system falls apart. So as we look at what is, what, how we are tied to Adam, I want us to think seriously, um, if, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, you need to start thinking very, 
very seriously about how it is you do believe. Um, there is a belief system out there that I grew up with that we are tied to Adam through our flesh. That in Adam's DNA was all the DNA of everyone, which is a very scientific thing, sounds very plausible. And so when Adam sinned, all of creation was cursed, which included his DNA. And so as he produces more and more children, they're cursed through his literal seed. Now, how many of you have taken a few semesters of church history already? All right, good. This would make your physical body evil, right? It's cursed. Physical body is evil. Does anyone know who that sounds like? The physical is evil. The spiritual is good. Gnosticism. How do you avoid Gnosticism if we are, if we're sinning through Adam, through his, through his seed, his literal seed? How do we avoid Gnosticism? Where we're saying, well, you know, how is it that my soul is cursed? My body is definitely cursed. We know that because, you know, Adam's DNA was cursed. How do I know my soul is cursed? Is our soul made of stuff? Does our soul generate out of our body so that it is also cursed? How is it that we're tethered this way? How do we answer these questions that have now become extremely scientific and philosophical and no longer really tied to scripture anymore? Well, I hope we can get to a, to a scriptural uh, understanding and I'll try and walk you through it as best I can. Um, for Van Til, we are tethered to Adam through covenant so that every human being is either a covenant keeper or a covenant breaker. And our minds are constantly in relation to that single idea. And as we look at Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, we see uh, that the fall involves uh, something more than just a physical cursing where it is merely our bodies that are cursed. Let's get to it then. I want you to turn to Romans 5, 12 through 14. Romans 5, 12 through 14. We're going to get into some Greek. I don't know how far along you are in your Greek. How far along are you in your Greek? Any uh, second semester Greek people? Nice, I see that nod. Okay. Third? Finished? finished? Nice. Okay, well, we're halfway there. All right, good. How many semesters do you guys have of Greek? Is it one, two, three? Two. two? And then you have the exegesis. Okay. All right, very good. Well, we're going to do a little today to whet your appetite for further classes. Hopefully I'll do it right so I don't <laughs> mess up your views. Okay. So Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, and this should be very familiar to you, I'm sure it is. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, so it's asking, Paul's asking the question, how is it possible for sin to be imputed? I hope that word sounds familiar to you. How righteousness is, you can say it, imputed, right? Righteousness is imputed to us. It's interesting he uses this word imputed when talking about sin. Sin is imputed when there is no law. He says, how could it be imputed when there is no law? Nevertheless, it does. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the... Uh, the, oh, the King James, very helpful. Uh, similti I'm having a hard time. <laughs> I can't say it. Similitude. How's that? That was pretty good. 
of Adam's transgression, who is the who is the figure of him that has that was to come. I want to look at verse fourteen now. Okay. Can anyone read this? A little bit. This one's easy. Esten. Everyone knows that. Is. And you know the 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 ho or hoss is the is who. Who is the tupas? What's tupas? Type, right? Good. Could even be translated pattern. Figure is not as great, I would say, but I'm you know, I'm not that not as good as those guys were. So tupas um, of, and we have a little bit of uh, participles there. The one to come. You can even say the one who is to come, if you like. So the tupas. I'm going to concentrate on that. Why why is Paul calling him a tupas? A type. Now, when you think of a type, there are some qualifications, are there not? Like, how is it that um, that uh, David was a type of Christ? Usually, it has to do with redemption, right? When David redeems the people by killing uh, by killing uh, Goliath, right? Here you had. Everyone was under bondage, right? The Philistines had him. And Goliath gets up there and, uh, you know, there's a, he's like a type of Satan, isn't he? He is the, the king that no one can destroy, the king of all power and might. And David gets up there and with a simple instrument brings down Goliath. And so we see a type because there is redemption involved. Is redemption involved with Adam in relationship to what Christ is doing? There seems to be a he, he seems to be relating the two. Something Christ did, something something Adam did. Is Adam redeeming people? No. <laughs> Adam is not redeeming anything. There is no type that we could say this is the typical type that we think of where we see a person redeeming just like Christ redeemed. What we see here is a different way of using the word type, like a pattern. <clears throat> Even the way the King James uses it, figure, um, if we if we go back to the context of when this was written, when we think of figure as you know, 21st century American thinkers, um, we have certain ideas that go through our head. But a figure uh, in in the days that this translation is made, you're thinking of a you've heard of the term father figure, right? Um, if someone is a father figure to you. They are in the place of your father. They're acting like your father. Does that make sense? So, in this translation, actually I should correct myself, it's a very good translation if you understand what they're saying by figure, right? Because sometimes we put our own baggage onto words, so we need to take it back a bit, right? So if, this is a, if he is a figure, he is duplicating or acting like someone else. Now, it may not be in a good way, right? But there is something that is being correlated here. What is being correlated? Let's look at uh, 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Are you starting to see the pattern here that's being duplicated? In the way that Christ is saving these people is a kind of way that everyone was condemned by this guy. 
Okay. So through Adam, everyone was condemned in a certain way in which they one day will be redeemed by one. Make sense? So what is that way? Is what we have to ask. Right? Christ died on the cross for our sins. Adam didn't do anything like that to, to bring upon judgment. So in what way is the, is the correlation being made? Well, here in Hebrews 12, 24, we see that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. This redemption, no matter what background you come from, is a covenantal redemption, right? Christ is the new covenant. He came to mediate this new covenant. This new covenant is our redemption, right? In which we are able, through spirit-wrought faith, we are able to be joined with Christ in which we are justified and sanctified simultaneously, distinctly, and completely, and even eschatologically. Right? Westminster Confession or the Westminster Shorter Catechism, I think it's number thirty eight, says that after when God when God resurrects all of us bodily we will be uh, justified. We will be pardoned. What is that? Have, what's that talking about? Scripture talks about the same thing. What is that about? Are we not, according to Romans eight one, now there is no there is now no condemnation? Absolutely, you are fully justified and fully sanctified, and we are fully justified by faith. But one day you will all be justified by sight because your bodies will be resurrected. Just as Christ was vindicated by the Spirit, right? In uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, vindicated by the Spirit through his resurrection. Right? The penal punishment is death. God's, God's uh, pleasure and vindication is resurrection. That's something we all get to look forward to. But all of this is made possible through this new covenant through Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 49, 8, <coughs> And I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. So in Isaiah 49, 8, he's, he, uh, God is saying, I'm going to send my servant. Right? This is a servant. Send my servant who will be the covenant of the people. I put a little Hebrew there, but we don't have time to go into all that right now. <laughs> Spurgeon, I thought this was nice neutral territory. Spurgeon said this, And I doubt not we have also rejoiced in the thought that Christ is the sum and substance of the covenant. We believe that if we would sum up all spiritual blessings, we must say Christ is all. He is the matter. He is the substance of it. And although much might be said concerning the glories of the covenant, yet nothing could be said which is not to be found in the word Christ. Man, that guy could speak, couldn't he? So here we have Christ, who is the new covenant, who is the mediator of the new covenant, who through this covenant is able to redeem us, who is able to make those who were not righteous, righteous. Now, this is what I'm proposing, is the similarity between Adam and Christ that Paul is referring to right here. That this similarity between Christ and Adam is that they both represented others through covenant. And if you look at this, this comparison, there's no real way to get around that textually in the way Paul has decided to use these, these words. If we look at uh, Romans 1,
I want to show you a demonstration that Paul brings out of what it means to be depraved. There's this big argument going on right now about total depravity and complete depravity and what we mean by that. People don't do everything that they could do that is evil. I'm not going into all that. I think <clears throat> I think it's it's kind of a misunderstanding of reformed theology to even have to argue about that. But if we look at Romans 1:18, this is what depravity looks like. This is what we mean and what Calvin meant when he was talking about depravity, because Calvin is the one that really helped us understand what the census divinitatis is really about. Does anyone know what that means, census divinitatis? Yes. Every man knows God. Every man knows God. See, this is, this is the difference between reform belief and other belief systems out there. Only in reform belief can you say, every man knows God, and I go into every conversation, even when I'm defending God to an atheist, I know that he knows God. While a lot of people are trying to defend Christianity with the assumption that the person doesn't know God, only in Reformed theology can you start your conversation knowing that that person knows. He knows. How do we know? Let's look. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I want you to look at the, the Greek here. <coughs> Can anyone point out the word truth? Yes, very nice. Okay. And unrighteousness? See the A is denying the next, right? Not righteous. Unrighteousness. Okay. Truth in unrighteousness. Then we have that last word. Someone pronounce it for me? Yes, got a contone. So what does that word mean? Yes, very good, good. Good, yeah, hold down. Nice. All right. Uh, other translations have used the word suppress. But you can think of it this way. Have you ever seen a little kid with a beach ball in a pool? He takes the beach ball and he pushes it down under the water. And that beach ball, if you know anything about, about physics, the most unnatural thing in the world is for something that's filled with air to stay underwater. So by nature, it's to come up. What has to happen for it to stay under the water? He has to suppress it. He has to hold it down which means he has to touch it, right? He knows what he's holding down. This is depravity. Depravity is not someone, I've never heard of such a thing. There's a God, I never knew anything about that. No wonder I've been sinning. Every human born is doing this. How do we know? Do we know because there's some scientific uh, experiment we can do on human beings to show that they actually do know God and they're lying? No. It's because our scriptures told us that every human knows there's a God and he suppresses the truth in his own unrighteousness. That's how you know. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. For God hath showed it to them. Okay? God made it evident. And where he made it evident is even more important than the Greek I put up there. <laughs> he made it evident in them. 
sensus divinitatis is not just an idea that Calvin came up with and we worship our fathers. It's something Calvin explicated for us, showed us, demonstrated for us in Scripture. Every man knows God. How do I know? Because when we look at Romans 1, 18 and 19, it is obvious that God has put that knowledge in them. In fact, this is why our fathers hated the word innate knowledge. In philosophy, the word innate means, um, means that you are born with knowledge already in your noggin. It's innate. It was, it was because um, of our fathers that we said, no, not innate, Rene Descartes. Implanted. Because implanted means someone put it there, and it was God. He put it in them. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, not sort of seen, not kind of seen, not if you have the right reason, then you could see it, not if you are smart enough, you could see it, clearly seen, being understood by the being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And you say to yourself, how is that possible? That just through creation and what God has planted in our head, we have enough knowledge of God to make us without excuse. It's not just possible. It's not even possible because you figured out how it is possible. It's possible and real because it's true. We know it's true because we were just told in verse 20. Right? Because in verse 20, we see clearly seen. I want you to look at that word. Katharatai. Right? Have you guys learned about the my a tie? When I go to my when I go to my job, I always wear my a tie. No, that's how I learned it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> enough Greek. Um, but uh, cathar, catharsis. Have you ever heard of that? Ever had a good catharsis uh, in Shakespeare plays? Why do we go see a Shakespeare play? We don't like ourselves, that's why. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, because, because we get a catharsis out of it. If we go see Hamlet, Hamlet's a tragedy, it's very sad. This guy tries to get revenge and everyone, literally everyone dies, except for his best buddy. And he almost, try, he almost died, but then it didn't happen. Uh, so why do we go watch that? Why am I going to watch this guy uh, but the, get this revenge for this guy killing his dad and now he married his mom, that's kind of weird, and then he kills this guy and then his mom dies. I mean, why are we watching all this? Because in the end, when justice is done, we feel clean. Right? Even though the justice is difficult and we kind of bonded with Hamlet and then he dies at the end and we feel kind of sad, he kind of deserved to die and you think, mm, catharsis, I feel clean about this. It's why men don't mind violence, right? We watch, you know, whether you're watching the news, or you're watching a movie, or you have guns. This is manly because men have a close relationship with justice. We have a close relationship with justice because our covenant head, Adam, was supposed to keep justice in God's creation and failed. And as men, we want that justice. There's a reason why we hold to our covenantal nature. Even unsaved men who feel this desire to have guns and to guard their family and stay with their family. I mean, especially here in the South, not so much in the North, but in the South. There's a lot of sense of family and protecting my family with my own guns. There's a sense of justice that is covenantal in men, right? Because when it comes to justice, there's a cleansing that we feel. And so when you think of catharsis, you have this idea here. Clean, clearly seen, absolutely clearly seen. All right, and verse 21. 
Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither uh, were thankful, but become but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is what depravity is about, right? A darkened heart. A heart that is by their by its na by its nature of thinking is darkened by its nature of feeling is darkened by its nature of willing is darkened he is darkened as a whole man and as we look at uh at this kind of depravity we are going to see that there is a direct link from this kind of depravity to a covenantal relation to Adam, not simply a seminal relation, but a covenantal relation. And we will look at that after our break. <laughs>